If we start backsliding, yep. we backslide all the way to tyranny. We're the arms attorneys. Um, buckle up, buckaroos, because we're doing something sort of unusual today. Uh, we're actually going to go through a recent news interview um, in which I was interviewed about red flag laws. And we are going to talk through a little bit of just typical media framing of firearms issues. And I think how we can best respond to the hard questions. Yep. So armed attorney reacts to Emily Taylor being interviewed. Uh, let's check it out. All right. Let's take this a few more steps to figure out how this is all working so far. Emily Taylor joins us again. She's a gun rights attorney based in Houston. Emily, these orders usually last for one year, but you see the same person brandishing new weapons, dealing with the same mental illness or drug abuse again and again and again. Is one year long enough? You know, actually, my concern with red flag law orders is that, yes, they are generally valid for one year, but at one year, they don't automatically expire. People are going back to court, and they are often renewed year over year in what amounts to a permanent ban on a constitutional right um, without, frankly, I think the due process that we generally put in place before we permanently remove the right to keep and bear arms from an individual. So, I mean, that's Do really... these red flag laws go far enough? I mean, that's the question, right? And and here's the deal, though, is that one year in perpetuity is a, I mean, it is a permanent ban. And so instead of going through the procedural due process of actually permanently banning someone from owning and possessing firearms, we're essentially using these red flag laws to kick the can down the road so that we're not really doing the thing that preserves the rights and we're just stripping it away. Yeah, and I think, and this happens in a lot of self-defense cases as well, you know, the cost to respond to these things, to show up, to have an attorney, to have an advocate, uh, th those are real costs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can also death by a thousand cuts these people. And we see that happen in red flag cases where uh, maybe they, you know, they're very passionate. They bring a, you know, they pay a lot of money. They lose on their first hearing, maybe lose on their second hearing. And then, you know, it's like, hey, man, why am I going to be shelling out money if I'm just going to be losing it? And they just give up on lawyers and um, effectively lose their rights forever. Right. I mean, bear in mind, this is not punishable by any days in jail. And what that means is you do not have a right to a free attorney at the cost of the state if you are indigent and cannot afford an attorney. That is incredibly important because tackling one of these things on your own is going to get you a red flag law ordered every single time. You can't do it by yourself. Yep. Where would that line be? Because somebody, let's say they have a paranoid thought disorder. Mm -hmm. um, do you think they should have a gun? Well, if they've been adjudicated mentally defective or if they've been involuntarily committed to a mental institution, they should not. Um, and we know that because the federal law prohibits those people from purchasing, owning and possessing firearms. And we draw that line in that place for, I think, a very good reason. So we draw the line at adjudication of mentally defective because it's very important. You've stood in front of a judge you know your due process has been followed, as opposed to these sort of nebulous, let's see where you're at in a year based on, frankly, very vague allegations of, um, uh, you know, this person is a danger to others. Perhaps there's no psychological evaluation, only um, just I mean, really the opinion of the person bringing the red flag order. And um, that's a dangerous place to draw a line when we're removing someone's rights, as opposed to what the federal law has dictated for years. Yeah, I mean, that is a, um, you know, how crazy of a person should be allowed to have a gun. Right. And I mean, you know, this is something that happens over and over again in the gun control debate is you hear people say, why are these people allowed to possess firearms? And frankly, most of the time they're asking that question. The answer is they aren't allowed. Right. The federal law already prohibits it. That's so, a good point. It's the yeah. same thing you see with we should ban machine guns. Well, effectively, most folks don't have a machine gun. Exactly right. So, I mean, that's one thing I think when we're when we're debating against the gun control folks is know your facts and know your law, because half the stuff they're asking for is actually already implemented. Yep. Almost all of these cases, or at least a great majority, involve drug and alcohol abuse. And I wonder if that's any trickier when you get to the legalities because a lot of people have known someone who has an alcohol problem um, but also owned a gun you know a lot of people probably think well my grandpa was kind of like that you get to drugs which drugs are we talking about how is all that sorted out 
Uh, well, and again, we have um, federal law that actually covers this. We have people who are unlawful users of controlled substances disallowed under federal law from purchasing, owning, possessing firearms. And of course, you know, it, it's difficult to be the person standing here saying, you know, look, how crazy is too crazy to be able to own and possess firearms? How many substances are, are too many substances? Or what is your abuse level that should um, still allow you to own and possess firearms? But really what we have is uh, a you know, lawyers talk about slippery slopes and people roll their eyes, but we have potentially a slippery slope and sliding into a world in which um, pre-crime is what we're regulating here. All right. What are your big takeaways from that? First of all, I wish I never had to say the word slippery slope again, because I know everyone hates it when lawyers say that. And I get it. And I wish there was sometimes a better term, but there's just not. I mean, that's the thing is we've, if we start backsliding, yep. we backslide all the way to tyranny. And I think it's kind of a bizarre, you know, upside down world when we say, prove to me that you're qualified, you know, to have a firearm where we mm -hmm. start at the at the position, hey, this person shouldn't have the right to keep and bear arms. And then you have to demonstrate, oh, you know, you're actually not an alcoholic, you're not crazy. You're... And so I think that, you know, not ceding any ground, you know, the law tells us what we can't do. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I don't understand. I mean, I think that pairs really perfectly with our judicial system of yep. guilty until proven innocent, Perfect. though, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. No, of course, it should not be that way. Anyone who's dealt in the legal system knows courts can take forever. If your brother is threatening to kill himself, you don't have hours or days or weeks, much less months to wait. Do these happen pretty quickly? Each state has its own timeline, and yes, our um, you know experience in just looking at how these function state by state is that the states are docketing them quickly, are taking them seriously. Each state, though, does implement its own individual timeline on the ex parte order, and then of course the permanent order. It kind of seems like their red flag law is the only tool in the toolbox. I know. I was just thinking. I wish I had said that. There is. Uh, you can. You can detain people who are an immediate threat to themselves for a period of time in every state, yeah. right? I mean, you get to take those people, make sure that they do not commit suicide or do not harm others, um, and have them evaluated for, you know, some sort of psychological issue. I mean, that just is a tool. Yeah, and I'd say on the backdrop of all of this, you know, crazy people, drug addicts, or people who are about to imminently self-harm, uh, there's a lot of conduct that is criminalized. These acts of violent behavior, these act, you know, these threats or threatening behavior towards other people, that's already a crime. Mm -hmm. That's already a crime, so. Finally, Emily, even gun rights activists um, who, who enjoy firearms, want them to be available, also say we want them in the right hands, the safe hands. We found red flag laws are being used pretty infrequently or not at all in some places. I looked at the numbers in Colorado in 2020, about 1,300 people there killed themselves. Yet we're seeing just a few dozen people reported via red flag laws. Um, should they be used more often to save more lives? Oh boy, that's a loaded question, isn't it? Um, you know, saving lives is a wonderful goal and hopefully something that we can all, as safe firearm owners and well-trained owners and good stewards of our community, we can hopefully help aid in that goal. However, should red flag law be the tool to get there? I don't think so. Um, they are not being, uh, though not being used very frequently in many states, they are fraught with constitutional issues, subject to abuse. And in most states, I believe we have the processes in place to help handle the unlawful possession or the possession of firearms by people who should not have them without resorting to the red flag law. Good call out. Yeah, well, okay, so look, this is like my favorite kind of question. Um, a couple of years ago at the Texas legislature, I was testifying against a bill. In fact, I think it was it a red it was a domestic violence sort of red flag bill. And one of the anti-gun lawmakers on the panel the was like, "Ooh, this is a good one." You know, Miss Taylor, tell me, what do you care more about, guns or moms? It was like uh, uh, the like, I think I'm, I think I'm going to quote you. I think he said, "I'm not going to go on the record and say moms aren't important." I know, something like that. <laughs> um, you're not going to get me on the record saying that I hate moms, yeah. right? Um but no, I mean that's the thing. Is it it's not a choice between it's not you know well you either want to save lives 
or you don't like red flag law. I mean, it's like th these things are not one or the other, right? We have competing interests, saving lives, wonderful interests, moms, great interests, right? Yeah. I'm highly invested in, you know, being good to moms. Um, but also we have to preserve everyone's rights. We don't get to cast this huge net to save a couple people and in the process abuse the rights of thousands, tens of thousands, millions. And that's really hard when you're kind of talking about lives being at stake. But I mean, ultimately you have to, you have to look at that and not sweep up everyone in your quest to save the few, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the balance between dangerous liberty and safe, I'm doing air quotes, slavery. Um, you know, we could all live in, we could set the speed limit at one mile per hour mm -hmm. if we really wanted to save lives, right? But uh, that would bring our lives to a grinding halt. And, you know, I think it is, a, it, it's a false paradigm. And um, I, you know, I don't know where they get the idea that, you know, people shouldn't be armed. I mean, I'm just gonna, I, I don't know where they get that idea that, uh, you know, because more lives are saved with firearms. We know that a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun. And we know that there are so many defensive gun uses. I can't imagine, I mean, we look around the world, uh, homicide rates, uh, you know, they don't change that much based on population. Uh, it just changes how folks do it, whether mm -hmm. it's with a firearm or some other tool. Oh yeah. All right, let's wrap this up. Uh, it is a hotly contested issue. Emily Taylor, I know um, you're not always giving the most popular opinion, but I appreciate you coming on and talking it through with us. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. That's true. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, a big shout out to Chance and to all the folks over at Newsy. Um, you know, this is not meant to dig at them at all. They are, you know, very upfront about their, you know, communications with us. They're great. I talk to them all the time. They ask the hard questions. They're respectful of the pro-gun opinion. So, um, you know, I guess just big shout out to them. Not the most popular opinion indeed, but we hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And please leave us a comment below. Um, you know, if you were me up there answering those questions, how might you have done it differently? How could you have done it better? I'd love to hear. Until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys.